it's my uh, tremendous delight and honor to converse and introduce uh, Mary Taylor and, um, sorry, who's the gentleman you brought <laughs> Mr. Taylor. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so this, the, this book is just fresh off the press, The Art of Vinyasa, and I'm guessing no one's seen it yet because it's that new, so we're going to take a, a dive into it tonight. Um, and then there'll be also time for uh, questions, thoughts. Richard specifically asked for uh, questions that are uncomfortable and <laughs> um, embarrassing particularly, so start readying those in your mind. Um, but not to take too much time in brief, my context with Richard and Mary, um, I moved to Boulder about 20 years ago, a wee lad of 20-something, and I'd studied at that point in two Hatha Yoga traditions. One, I would say, exceptionally minimalist in its descriptive style of practice. You know, essentially headstand was put your head on the ground, and the more nuanced instruction was legs in the air. <laughs> and then after that, it's antithesis, <laughs> uh, a tradition that basically wrote dissertations about which hair follicles you put on the ground and headstand, <laughs> right? Um, and I arrived in Boulder and a friend suggested I check out the yoga workshop. And I remember that first class um, with Richard and I kind of had this um, experience because um, it kind of felt like I'd walked into a haiku like this incredibly rich aesthetic experience. Yes, metaphor and poetic imagery and, uh, of course, humor, um, but also this almost unspoken or silent practice of attentiveness. So much so that after class, I very shyly, you probably don't remember this, but I shyly came up to you and asked about kind of, where does this descriptive style come from, you know? And I think it probably came out more like, Whoa, <laughs> dude. <laughs> I remember that. Oh, do you? Yeah. <laughs> <That's>... <clears throat> um, but you generously deflected any credit to the tradition <clears throat> and began by um, referencing, like early yogic literature, the way that the garland of the goddess kind of drapes around her torso as a precursor to like this style of alignment um, discussion or description, which I think is very apropos because in reading the beginning of this book, you see that the art of vinyasa, the art isn't used casually or lazily as it sometimes is, there's a thousand books of the art of, but um, it truly, from the, not so much the perfunctory details of practice, though they are there as well, it really speaks to kind of the aesthetic dimension of the practice, both physically and psychologically. So I thought maybe we could begin there since this is new to all of us. What is this book? How does it fit in kind of the corpus of Mary and Richard's work thus far? Mm. Oh, well. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. If you need a refresher, it's yeah, right here. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> <clears throat> I was just saying there's a word um, in association with art mm -hmm. in, uh, called rasa, mm -hmm. which uh, means juice. Um, you know, if you juice a fruit, then you drink the rasa mm -hmm. of the fruit. Um, but in aesthetics, it means proportion mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the, just the right blending of different points of view and the right blending of different uh, attitudes. Mm -hmm. And finally you get, you know, the mwah, right. the taste. And, uh, and so much of, you know, the practice that uh, we do, you know, meditation practice, mm -hmm. asana practice, pranayama practice, it's really a matter of good taste. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so a lot of it, we're just learning to have good taste mm -hmm. in the practice. And so, and that would apply also to, you know, descriptions or to metaphors mm -hmm. or to mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a it's a matter of good taste. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so within these traditions, uh, good taste isn't just a matter of 
you know, just kind of frivolous beauty or something, but it's a matter of uh, the good taste takes you right through mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And so you start to have this experience of the rasa. Yeah, it's mm. interesting because I think, I think many people, when they <clears throat> start to study oh, okay. <laughs> the origins of... <laughs> When people start to look into the origins of asana, uh, you know, they first encounter, okay, asana as a, like a classic, in the classical tradition of Patanjali, of a meditation seat, or the yeah. heroic ascetic gesture to conquer the vicissitudes of life. Later in Hatha Yoga, um, as kind of working with unfolding the pran. Um, and of course, modern day interpretations that are more to the point about uh, achieving washboard abs and bonds of steel, um, but what I what it's a matter of taste. <laughs> yeah, it's a taste. But what's interesting. The book begins by actually illustrating a whole other dimension to the study of asana that that I don't think many of us are not as familiar with, which was the art of visualization. Mm -hmm. Really, in a sense, mingling our mind with the deity, whether it be the goddess or or mm -hmm. whomever, and letting that inform. The body. The practice, yeah. The whole body, yeah. yeah. And, and that's a process mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. goes on anyway. Right. Um, you know, you're out driving your car and you're um, sort of feeling like you're some sort of warrior on the right. highway and you, you're you envisioning this and, and visualizing it and embodying, mm -hmm. you know, whatever whatever sort of day-to-day -day thing you're doing, but you're not necessarily doing so consciously. Right. And so one of the one of the aspects of you know a yoga practice that can really make it um, feel full is to to have some sort of you know uh, context, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. uh, with a deity that mm -hmm. you that you really feel along the, the midline of the body. Mm -hmm. um, in a conscious way, and then once you do that in your practice, then you know. Then when you're in the day-to-day -day situations that you find yourself in normally, where we're unconsciously embodying our mind, right. um, there's there's kind of a buffer right. to the to some of the the things that are are not necessarily as healthy that may naturally arise. Right. So it's kind of an interesting practice yeah. to go for. And it's also, you know, it, it opens up a whole new realm within the practice, which is part of what we love about it. Right. And in the mm -hmm. book, you refer to this as um, Amrita Plavana, I think, mm -hmm. if I remember. But, you know, I think um, there was a, a time early on when I was really working on flexibility much more diligently and achieved that that golden carrot of both legs behind the head. And I remember I had an epiphany in that moment. I looked around and I realized I'm basically the same old schmuck. Nothing had really changed. With two legs behind With two legs behind the head, it's even worse. It's <laughs> yeah. kind of almost worse. Yeah. It's worse. Um, but I, you know, I think when I'm, I'm imagining most people when they come to such a rigorous practice like Ashtanga, um, they're forced at some point to examine Kind of the stories they have about their body, um, their ideas about perfection and its close bedfellow inadequacy, and also all of the kind of strange and silly unconscious intentions we kind of mm -hmm. overlay on the practice. Um, I think what I've always appreciated about your teaching styles is you continuously kind of dismantle the, the agenda or the ambition behind the practice yeah. and kind of convey the deeper kind of purpose and process of yoga. But I was really struck in this book of, you know, how we often think of Ashtanga from that very disciplined side of work with alignment and breath and pran and bandha. But here you speak to almost this fruitional dimension, this kind of release model. I had to look up, I had to uh -huh. reference Monier Williams to get Plavana, but it, <laughs> is this overflowing, mm -hmm. in a sense, or diving into. Yeah, the release. So I would be curious to hear more about mm -hmm. this, this kind of dimension of the practice that um, 
almost as the uh, outcome or the fruit of the practice. Well, interesting, the word vinyasa, Mm -hmm. which is such a popular word these days, um, which the general translation, everyone, it just means sequence. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to place my postures in a sequence that works. And true. Um, But they take the word apart and it gets interesting. Um, The word nyasa is the basic word. And nyasa is uh, used in sanctifying things. Mm -hmm. And so, and I first learned it when living in India, you know, you'd take a bath Mm -hmm. in in the ashram, and then after you take a bath, you had to do nyasa. Right. in which you would take, place, yeah. you you would place uh, basically mantras mm-hmm. uh, in your fingertips, mm-hmm. and then you would install, you know, mm-hmm. in different places around the body. And you'd end up coating. At one point, you'd, you'd coat your entire body with a particular mantra, so that mm-hmm. in each pore of your skin there was a little seed mantra of whatever the particular deity was mm-hmm. that you had an affection for. Mm-hmm. And so it would be on the top of the head and in the heart and all over. Mm-hmm. And the nyasa. Mm-hmm. And so it's the placement. And it makes something which is kind of ordinary. All of a sudden it's become the the high holy ground, the holy mountain, the temple of temples. And, uh, and then in order to do nyasa, and then the word, another word related is sannyasa, mm-hmm. uh, which is the the stage of life where you become a complete monk, you know, you're, and you take everything, sun, you collect it all together, the whole universe, and then you just say, and you put it down, and in putting it down, all of a sudden, it's then like, it's active, it's not like you're throwing it away, like when you do nyasa, you don't like throw the mantras and the deities, like, get off of me, you know, but it's like you're placing it, and then, you just leave it be, you step back, and then the, mm. it, it does what it does. Right. And so then, so vinyasa is, the speci- it just means specific placement, okay, in order so that after a few vinyasas, then you get a nyasa. <laughs> and then a few minutes later you start again, you do a little vinyasa, and then finally you get Nyasa. <laughs> and you can do that all day. And then, <laughs> and, and, you know, and then it becomes a, um, you know, an aesthetic mm-hmm. practice right. where you are, are really um, feeling the embodiment of it. And, and one of the things about aesthetics is that it almost is as though that sense of, of have, bringing aesthetics into our lives mm-hmm and having a sense of um, beauty and all those things we asso- and associate with aesthetics, um, that's almost as though it's a, a f- fundamental need mm-hmm. in our lives that we sometimes overlook. Right. And um, through the practice, through the concentration, through vinyasa, through allowing the sort of absorption of you know, kindness to fill every pore of the body, right. to flood our senses, that that has the same sense of an aesthetic experience, which mm-hmm. then, you know, kind of gets the wheels rolling mm-hmm. and feeds feeds the, the feeling of being alive and mm-hmm. awake as much as you can be awake. Yeah. And you both have given yourself to um, the study of, you know, a very unique vinyasa, I, you know, a number of years ago, <clears throat> With trepidation and reluctance, I uh, registered our program with Yoga Alliance, and they require you to um, tell what style of yoga you teach, which I'd never really thought of in that terms. So they have a whole list of the styles you can pick from, and so I went into the list thinking, oh, probably this is 15 or 20 I'm going to have to sort through. Um, Ashtanga, Iyengar, and uh, I, my jaw dropped when I saw that there was nearly a thousand styles of yoga. And um, 
even if I'd wanted to create Nataraja Yoga that had already been taken. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and it struck me that we've probably created more styles of yoga in the last 30 years than had been well, created in the last 3,000 yeah. years. Wow. Um, <laughs> which kind of made me curious about the difference between innovation mm -hmm. and personalization. Because it seems like there's probably a little bit of both going. There's probably some extraordinary innovation that's happening in these cultures, mixing and interfacing and levels of science and philosophy. And there's a lot of personalization where you just add a little something, something and make it your own. Um, I'm, just, I'm just very fascinated in, in such a disposable society to give yourself to a vinyasa for so mm -hmm. many years and what you learn through that. Um, I was disappointed that I didn't see Richard and Mary Yoga. <laughs> on the list. I'm disappointed too. <laughs> <laughs> or at least, you know, Hollywood conflation. Like it's coming. Merichard? Merichard. Merichard. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> what's, what's interesting is. If, even if you're very orthodox in any particular school mm -hmm. in which innovation is not really part of right. any orthodoxy, you want to, you know, you, you want to, you know, if you're, you want to cook the recipe exactly like your mother cooked it, and she cooked it like her, you know, and it goes back and back and back, theoretically to right. a, some prophet or saint mm -hmm. or since the beginning. Yeah. You know, that's, um, but those who are, you know, and I know a lot of kind of orthodox practitioners, they, mm -hmm. but those who are happy, you know, they actually, they, they customize it. You know, there's always that point of innovation, right. Right. which is creative, even in a health, you know, healthy orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's possible. It's not an oxymoron, but mm -hmm. you can have a healthy orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but they, they're doing it and just deferring. Mm -hmm. So this is what my ancestors really meant. Mm -hmm. You know, they were talking about the amrita mm -hmm. rather than the, you know, the description mm -hmm. of, of you know just the what your belly is doing or something. But the, what they were really talking about, and of course that's to to individualize the orthodox is a bit. Um, it takes courage, but. Uh, and I think you, anyone who stays with you know a single Orthodox practice eventually has actually trans their their understanding of it has changed mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. years and years of practice, mm -hmm. and so it becomes a kind of friendly Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> after millions of years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then of course, <laughs> but, but also the same Orthodox school is going to naturally generate in other people mm -hmm. doubts and like that is extreme, or that's dangerous, mm -hmm. and what about this, and what about that? Mm -hmm. And um, any school is very hesitant to communicate, you know, well, let's just, let's talk about it. What do you really mean by that word? Mm -hmm. And what do you really mean by that act? And, and that takes sometimes generations for different groups to actually mm -hmm. see each other and to communicate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, and I think a, an important distinction too, Nataraj, as you brought up, is that the difference between innovation, which is, mm -hmm. you know, what keeps a lineage alive mm -hmm. and healthy, is mm -hmm. that it isn't just rigid and stuck, right. um, and that you have this this sort of unfolding of right. the of the uh, tradition. Mm -hmm. And the difference between that and personalization, right. which is really interesting to watch in this day and age, you know how people uh, can can have this sense of oh, I, I really want to shift it somehow, and I need to shift it. But mm -hmm. rather than letting that unfold within the context, mm -hmm. which is what innovation does, it, mm -hmm. it's a, it's context dependent mm -hmm. more so than you know sort of for a personal. Um, reason it's it you know it certainly could have the a personal context but it's it's a bigger context within the whole picture and I think that's a really important and interesting yeah. differentiation 
um, for all of us who study yoga to, to look at our tendency to, you know, want to personalize it and to, you know, realize there is some personal element to it, but then where does the ego step in and kind of codify it? Right. And where are we working within a context of a tradition to step out of it ourselves and let the tradition become more rich? Mm-hmm. So that's, a, that's an interesting point. You know, uh, you both were at Estes when Ayengar came a few mm-hmm. years ago, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think, it was the, I think it was the first thing he said. Was anybody else there? I think D might have been there. I think it was the first thing he said. He comes into this room of, I don't know, 500 of us. And he says, you know, I've been practicing for 72 years without interruption. And I consider the first 40 years of my practice to be quite immature. Now, meanwhile, many of us were there, you know, with full banker's pose. I've been practicing for 15 years. <laughs> what quite I mean, banker, banker's pose kind of wilted a little bit. <laughs> um, that's, that's all my lead-in to... Um, uh, I'm curious to hear what, where the gravity of your practice is now. I mean, I don't, can I call you seasoned practitioners? Is that? We're seasoned, but I don't know about seasoned <laughs> practitioners. <laughs> where, where, like, where, is, where are you finding ah, that spark of edge or growth or challenge now that you've put a few laps in? They're all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> this, this could take a yeah. long time. Going back to basics is what's happening. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, oh, um, you know, just, of course, I mean, we use breath a lot, mm-hmm. and vinyasa, inhaling and exhaling, is your basic sequence. And so going back to that, mm-hmm. and particularly this time of year, which is um, you know, late autumn, mm-hmm. beginning of winter, um, there's a lot of uh, you know, suffering right. um, that comes through, you know, it's just kind of chaotic suffering that comes through. And um, so we're always brought back to like just that inherent suffering and impermanence. Mm-hmm. Um, I hear you. And so we just kind of like breathe into it, you know, right. a little compassion. Right. And then the technique is still, you know, fairly simple vinyasa. Even if you're just sitting there, it's still like, if you're off, your intelligence naturally makes a, a, a context, almost a, a kinesthetic context mm-hmm. that is then the vinyasa or the next stage. Mm-hmm. You know, they call it the pratipaksha. As the mm-hmm. paksha is the wing. Mm-hmm. And pratipaksha is your other wing. Mm-hmm. And so you're always in this process, well, the one wing starts flapping, and then, oh, the other wing comes along. And so it's, my practice is very elementary. <laughs> Returning. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious also at just a personal level, I know, I mean, we know Mary's been the ghostwriter for your other books, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but what, I think of the title and then I say, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm curious what it was like to write a book together. I mean, somehow I had this image of Mary writing and you kind of pacing in the background <laughs> until, until he doesn't pace until something so downloaded, <laughs> like you know, swan dive like. A drunken sailor hitting the picket <laughs> fence, or you know, oh no, scratch that cookie dough. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. How how did that? How Sometimes was that? I write that way. You yeah. know, I, I sit there and I babble uh-huh. on, you know, uh-huh. um, for anywhere from just a few minutes to. Yeah. A few more minutes. A few more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Is it getting worse with age? <laughs> and uh, then. Um, She'll type it down, and then mm-hmm. uh, then we'll sometimes she'll send it to me, mm-hmm. you know, email it to me, and I'll mm-hmm. work on it, and then we toss it back and forth and mm-hmm. trim it out. Yeah, know. it's it's, and, it's, and it's and a good it, process that we somehow, good. you know, we we outline it, mm-hmm. and so then we have an idea of where we're headed, right? And um, and 
it's fun. It's we enjoy it. You know, we we sort of have known each other long enough and know how we both think that uh, you know we'll write something out and then it'll um, by the end we really don't know who's written what. Right. So right. that's you know maybe it's a function of age and we just can't remember. <laughs> but. <laughs> That sounds also like yeah, a good that, it works, you know. <laughs> the beauty of confluence. Um, <clears throat> this is something that's curious to me is there's this new thing called um, the economy of attention um, as, as essentially tech savants um, manufacture these um, WMDs. Uh, Weapons of mass destruction. No, um, um. wireless mobile devices. Uh -huh. More powerful. <laughs> um, you know, as they have confessed, they're in a sense racing to the root of our brainstem through um, uh, designing technology that, in a way, um, speaks to almost our human vulnerabilities or needs for. Um, connection and approval mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the degree where, you know, we'll be scrolling or checking all the time in a, in a very addictive way. So I think if, you know, if attention and distractibility was, a, was an issue for Patanjali and co, um, what's the deal now? And does, does, does practice need to, in a sense, adjust to meet almost this kind of neurological addiction that this kind of have to new uh, now I always I always have to qualify I know every time there's new technology the there as a self confessed Luddite and curmudgeon <laughs> older generations always say oh it's gonna melt their brain and we inevitably adjust but I am curious you know because we probably did that when the answering machine came out yeah. but it's it's almost <laughs> a, it's a different playing field now in yeah. terms of you know this level of distraction yeah. And mm -hmm. does yoga even, at least the, this inner limb of yoga, even make sense? Or in a sense, does it need to reinvent itself to meet kind of the current cultural climate of how we're wiring and firing? That's it. That's my only question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it still makes sense. Right. And I think it is one of the cultural, you know, elements that we, as people who are working within the Right. our own practices and teaching yoga that that has to be looked at carefully because there are you know the, the the what what we're running into often with younger people is that they almost come to the practice and then this form of practice it's a very meditative mm -hmm. but rigorous form mm -hmm. as a means of escaping for a few moments, right. like they know they can't, right. you know, have their their cell phone with them, and they don't have one of the mats with the readouts on right. it that is now made, um, and uh, and so, you know, I think it's something that we're just on the verge of of trying to understand and, mm -hmm. and figure out. Mm -hmm. But but it could be that it, that there is some benefit to that. Mm -hmm. That there is some concentration skill that is being honed mm -hmm. but then we have to look carefully at what that you know what the repercussions of how it's being mm -hmm. honed are mm -hmm. and how maybe you know we could dovetail on that to have a uh, more introspective and more integrated mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. yeah i think the potential is that it could be really wonderful mm -hmm. you know this kind of multi-layered information technology mm -hmm. and feedback right. because you do get feedback mm -hmm. you know from your body and from your environment mm -hmm. um, the old organic method mm -hmm. but uh, electronically right. you can get feedback and you can get all types of uh, information you know sent to you right. you know from some cloud somewhere right. um, <laughs> That corresponds to you know, the the particular your your heart rate or you know some something in an fMRI that uh, is hooked onto your brain, mm -hmm. and it could be quite a profound uh, educational experience. Mm -hmm. um, 
just like neurofeedback mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, these are all very interesting things. And, but, you know, a kind of primitive organic feedback is just like, you know, just sensation and breath and touch, which is still going to be there, but then just seeing the, the instant relationship. Yeah, and if you t but as much as there's that potential, there's also the potential for mm -hmm. just as much suffering from the technology, <laughs> uh, which I think is coming up. You know, every time you, <laughs> you know, you, you finally get on a, a retreat somewhere mm -hmm. where you're, you're finally going to, like, look at life, and then you have to pull out your camera and do a selfie. Here I am. <laughs> And then you have to do a selfie of your selfie and country. a selfie, and again, an infinite right. regress of selfie. Right. And like, <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I'm trying to find out if it's uh, whether Twitter or Instagram is the quickest way to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. well, well, we'll find out. Yeah, we'll, we'll find, find out, out soon <laughs> enough. <laughs> cool. I'm curious if anyone has uh, got something percolating they'd like to ask Richard and Mary about. Since I have the privilege of knowing what's inside the book, um, I was hoping that you could speak to the presentation of um, Ashtanga Yoga in a way that uh, is different from what one would expect when they open a book on Ashtanga Yoga. So, um, mm -hmm. speaking to, I mean, it, I think those of us who have studied with the two of you wouldn't be surprised by it, but many people might be surprised to open it and find um, that things have been dismantled. So, could you speak to that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so if someone says, I do Ashtanga Yoga, uh, if you look traditionally uh, at the eight limbs, because it means Ashta Anga, eight Angas, um, and so they're the eight limbs that are in Yoga Sutra, uh, Patanjali, and they're also the eight limbs that are in the teachings of the Buddha. Um, similar but different, you know, but the, the idea is. And, and so these are a, a way of contextualizing any practice that you do, any concentration practice, or self-improvement practice, or selfless improvement practice, or um, any endeavor you're going to make, um, to say, you, to put it in the context of these eight limbs, is going to basically place it in a context where you um, whatever the technique is, so you can have all kinds of techniques and do Ashtanga Yoga. You can merely sit there, and we're all going to be reduced to this, or lie there, you know, and our sun salutation will be... <laughs> <laughs> okay. The ghost and of Christmas future. The best we can do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that could be a fine Ashtanga practice. Um, but if you look at um, the various limbs, it, they start out with ahimsa, or nonviolence, not hurting or being kind, and they're very socially oriented. And then as you get into, eventually you get into uh, postures uh, in which you are seeking to be very grounded, okay, and then but very open stira and sukha. And then the pranayama uh, is basically opening up the prana. So it's prana and then you add the word ayama onto it, which means to remove the restrictions from the prana. And then that uh, removes, and then in the ashtanga then it's pratyahara, mistranslated as sense withdrawal, mm -hmm. but it means not to bite the sense fields to make objects, yeah, but just to appreciate the sensation, mm -hmm. the, the sensation almost as pure openness or pure awareness. It's just this direct experience of transformation 
in all the sense fields. So prana is this, what sensation is. And then you get into the contemplative layers where you're finally focusing the mind on a, you're playing a game in which you say, well, this field or this desha is the holy field and I'm going to concentrate there. And by that point you realize, well, that's what mind likes to do that. You know, this is it. No, that's it. No, this is it. And so I have the holy field and then you are at first distracted, so I can't pay attention to that. Oh, my phone is ringing, I can't pay attention. And then you eventually start to see through the field that it is, there's nothing there that isn't uh, a product of what's outside of it. And so the, the background, which is very vast, uh, is interfaces completely and presents as the foreground. And then you can actually pay attention to the foreground because it now contains everything. And then the final is samadhi, in which you see that there's no um, separateness in what you're observing. There's no uh, separate self, but it's all this, what you, what you would say, and it's all this interfacing delight. And so to say you do a shtanga uh, isn't really specifying the exact techniques you're using, uh, but it's it's saying that you're really opening to this uh, presentation of reality or enlightenment or liberation um, yeah. in that context. And uh, like Patabi Joyce actually was very much aware of that. So he was saying, oh, this is technically, people, oh, this is vinyasa yoga. And then he said, no, this is actually ashtanga vinyasa yoga. Because... You can do yoga without that context very easily. Uh, we've all tried it uh, repeatedly, and uh, it creates more suffering. Yeah, and within this system, there are series of postures that are traditionally practiced, you know, um, as part of the practice. And so in the book, one of the reasons, in addition, that we shifted it around rather than just having specific series, this is one posture, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this. We put them into families of postures um, and looked at, you know, backbends as a particular family and they come in, you know, you have backbends in different series. And part of our rationale in doing so was uh, to show to those of us who do on a daily basis sort of do these practices that allow us to get into a meditative state as we practice and then think, well, this is what yoga is. You do the same poses over and over in this order to to wake us up a little bit and say, wait a minute, these backbends that I'm doing in this series are related to the ones in this series and how do they interface and how do they interface with forward bends? And so it's it was partly, um, our organization was partly in order to to kind of pause for a moment and say, what, what are we actually doing when we step on our mats? And then we get to these deeper levels of understanding that, you know, it really isn't that we're trying to put our feet, legs behind our head, mm -hmm. although we may be do, trying to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, hopefully it will be helpful. Yeah. So the various prescribed series are really like learning scales or yeah. when you're learning a musical instrument. You know, some clever teacher has designed all of these scales that have very interesting transitions and relationships between this, this particular posture and then the residue that it leaves and then what the next posture mm -hmm. does with that residue. But it's giving you all of these tools um, for... Um, which in themselves, you know, if you have a nice practice, are just like mm -hmm. wonderful in and of themselves. But then when you go into the pranayama and then different practices of meditation or visualization, the same tool, the, these are tools that then you use. And it's good to kind of have an idea or a sense of what the tools are for. <laughs> Otherwise, it's like someone, you inherit, you know, this huge factory um, but you have no idea what all of the, the, the tools are for, and this can be a kind of dangerous. <laughs> um, 
But and so in that way you are paying. Or I like the the analogy of a, a surgeon in a an operating room. There are all these fantastic tools, techie equipment. But you know the the surgeon is there, and they have you know hopefully from fairly good focus about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they'll go in there and they'll just take a tool and they've learned the technique and they say, ah, and then the tool is just like gone. And what really counts is what they're paying attention to. And so, um, and so we want to highlight that aspect of Ashtanga, Vinyasa Yoga, like this is what it's for. This is actually what is being passed down in the tradition. I think because we're in the heart of the Shambhala matrix, it would be good form to tell a Trungpa Rinpoche story. Yeah. Uh, my favorite one. Uh, um, Thus have I heard um, to commemorate um, Naropa's inauguration, Trungpa Rinpoche called uh, for an interfaith conference where teachers from every tradition were invited to present. 2,000 people showed up. They rented up some auditorium, maybe Mackey Auditorium at CEO. And Trungpa Rinpoche was to be the uh, keynote speaker at 7 p.m. Friday night. So everyone dutifully arrives in contemplative equipoise, and 7 p.m. comes and no Trungpa Rinpoche. 7.15, 7.30, 7.45, 8 p.m. still no Trungpa Rinpoche. And now start people, people start losing their contemplative cool. Um, <laughs> somewhere around 8.45, the doors burst open, and in comes um, a very spirited Trungpa Rinpoche. Um, <laughs> And he makes his way to the, to the podium, and he grabs the podium, and in a moment of kind of searing lucidity, he says, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism are all babysitters. There should come a point when you no longer need a babysitter. Mm. And then he walked away leaving, I'm guessing, all the other presenters to start furiously editing their notes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, somehow that yeah. story speaks to yeah. this, this, this tension of learning, learning, yeah. learning the scales to get to that point where... Yeah. Well, and so much of what we do is this process right. of formulating and letting go, and not, as Richard said in the beginning, not throwing stuff away, but carefully right. putting it down. Right. And, you know, it's almost creating mm -hmm. a floor of context. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And what's exciting about the current age is we're doing that culturally, mm -hmm. too. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there are a lot of people kind of a little afraid of this <laughs> at right. the moment. But, you know, cultures actually interface rather than just bumping mm -hmm. in the dark, mm -hmm. you know, bumping off. Mm -hmm. They actually communicate, interface. Mm -hmm. And it makes all of them upgrade. Right. And I go, wow. Challenges oh, yeah. a lot of assumptions. Challenge your assumptions, yeah. but then you rediscover mm -hmm. like what mm -hmm. what was yeah. important. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's quite exciting. Right. And that's true with all of the you know, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's happening. <laughs> Riddles, <laughs> puzzles. Hi, everyone up there. Um, just as I'm listening to you, I have a question. I don't know if it can be answered, but I'll, I'll ask it. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, Richard Mary Nataraja, too. Um, as I listen and I hear, I'm just reminded again about the, the depth of Ashtanga Yoga and um, yeah, the depth of it all. I'm just, I'm kind of wondering like, okay, so for someone who has two little kids and has been through different phases with my um, capacity to really in, you know, immerse myself in studying yoga, I'm, I'm sort of this question of um, what's enough? What's enough for, for me? And I'm kind of sitting here thinking, gosh, I don't want to go for too many years just kind of taking the little snack, yoga snacks that I'm getting right now. <laughs> and 
Um, and I'm also, I know we all have different goals as humans and as practitioners. And I guess just what I'm wanting to ask is something along the lines of, um, just given your lives, what you would say is, you know, what not to miss out on about yoga. Um, <laughs> or um, uh, what's essential? Um, what are the, the, the basics that um, are not to be missed? Something along those lines, just as I'm sort of maybe rebuilding practice once again. Mm. Maybe always doing that, but... I, I, I think one thing that happens to many yoga students in their very first yoga class or one of the first yoga classes is that, that, that we're practicing and we disappear. And in terms of, there's this moment where people very often say they had a yoga practice and it was just this profound experience and, and they couldn't really even describe it. It's something about just being touched in a way that they've never experienced before. And what I think that yoga often does when we don't have preconceptions that override us um, is that the practices just naturally tap into the truth of uh, being authentic and being real and being human. Um, and, and that's just part of the byproduct of a good practice. And it ha happens often to brand new students because there aren't as many preconceptions when you walk in the door as to what to expect or what might happen, et cetera. And so um, I think one of the reasons people get hooked into doing yoga is that we have this connection that happens to something much deeper than ourselves. Um, and it happens in meditation as well, obviously. And um, so to your point, I think one of the things to bear in mind is uh, that w as we practice through different difficulties, through different uh, situations in our lives, that when we are able to practice in a way, whether it's a little snippet or a yoga snack or... Um, but when we can practice in a way that taps into a sense of truth within us, um, then that's what we're looking for. That's, that's what, it's not what we're out there trying to make happen, but that's when it is enough. And part of what happens when you practice repeatedly the way one does, I mean, part of what we talk about in yoga is that you have to show up. You show up every day, you do something. And it's not necessarily a full series, which is another reason we didn't, you know, have the book designed in terms of a full series. Um, when you do practice day in and day out, riding the breath, having action and counteraction and the relationship of those things within your your visceral experience, then it doesn't take as long sometimes when there are difficulties, injuries, interruptions, for you to be able to tap back into that more quickly. Um, and so, kind of, you know, from what I know of you, you, you know, you've been a consistent practice over the years. And we, by, by knowing that there's more you want, that's a good sign. And when time arises, um, you will do what is the appropriate practice. But in our lives, when we have other responsibilities, those are vitally important, and as you know. And so that's, rather than resenting our obligations, um, we embrace them. Mm -hmm. And we look for that same sense of depth that the yoga practice just spontaneously wakes up in us, that we look for the situations that we can um, find ourselves in that allow us to feel that, because then we can be there with whatever it is that's coming up for us. So I think that, you've, you know, we do the work, and my experience, having been through all kinds of <laughs> you know, physical difficulties and, you know, 
emotional difficulties, deaths, and, you know, glorious things that have happened in my life, too, um, is that the practice is, becomes part of sustaining what a life, and that's what it's for. Mm. And uh, it, I feel very grateful for that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a term that we've used a lot recently called kitchen yoga, mm-hmm. <laughs> which might refer to just five minutes of practice or ten minutes of practice, uh, but it can be very tasty mm-hmm. and nutritious. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we get so idealistic, you know, if I can't go on retreat for three years, you know, I'm no good, and uh, you know, but three minutes is a lot longer than nothing, you know, yeah. and. Uh, and it can alter your entire day, you know, so, mm. yeah. Our kids, are, our kids are the same age, so I'm right there. I appreciate your question. Most days I just feel like, you just see Louis C.K. when he was asked what it's like to have a third child. He just had his third child. Someone in the audience asked, what's it like to have three kids? He said, imagine you're drowning and someone hands you a child. Um, so, <laughs> most, <laughs> most days it's like that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but I, I think one of the most, the most formative teachers early on for me uh, was Ramana Maharshi when I lived in Tiruvannamalai. And there was always this, you know, when you read the conversations of the disciples to Ramana of this wanting to move to the forest or to the cave Mm -hmm. and Ramana always saying no it's the mind that needs to be transformed and so for me it's always that that reminder that I think the fruition of the practice is to not use the practice for handholds but ultimately to to come to that place where every experience you know is kind of in a sense a mirror and a challenge um so that's at least my yeah. m- reminder. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Good question. Yeah. Anything else, Raj? <coughs> I don't need one. Unless you need one. Yeah. I need one. <laughs> Thank you. I'm one. Okay. Hi, my name's Raj. Um, my question, kind of, I had I had something thought of before I came, and then. Luckily, Nataraja mentioned that um, there were a thousand types of, of yoga in the Yoga Alliance, which is, I think, very interesting. And my hope is that most of them come from a place that, that works through the eight, limb, eight limbs, not in, in the sense of, of Ashtanga with the primary series and secondary and that, that, that side, but with these moral grounding beliefs and pranayama and meditation. Um, and so what I would ask of you is this idea of um, yoga as a gateway being a place for whoever to enter. And, and I know there's some, um, I guess, consternation about what yoga is becoming in the West and the evolution that, it, that it's taking on. And my thought has always been that it really is in how a person enters, but also where they go from there. And, and just like Mary said, you know, whether you show up, um, when you show up every day, there's a, there's a change that happens regardless of what, what style or what kind, I believe. Um, and so I guess my question is, what would be your um, kind of guidance knowing that this evolution is happen, happening, knowing that um, there is heated power yoga. There is um, all these different styles of yoga that might not bring to the forefront all those all those uh, those limbs, but really in the background want to. Um, but it's difficult in in an entry style um, where so many people are trying it for for the first time. Was that clear? I kind of rambled for a little. Bit. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes people always ask me, what do you think of the contemporary yoga scene? And I'm always going, <laughs> and uh, I remain hopeful. <laughs> but it's, it's also a little bit scary, too. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people entering almost from the point of view of either perhaps in a, a, a cult-like way, and meaning... Uh, cultish way in which 
Theirs is the only, they're not allowed to communicate with any other tradition. They're not allowed to read only, you know, what comes from some one person somewhere. And, you know, that can be, that can be very problematic. It can, you know, harm people. Um, but I also love the great variety, you know, and kind of the innovation that's occurring too. Um, because I think the majority, most of it is, you know, well-intentioned and is actually kind of people see, you know, oh, this, this is interesting, let me put that out there. And I think as long as there's um, well, good communication, if, if people like are, don't become, you know, defensive or aggressive about their particular thing, their particular style, um, but they continue to communicate and inquire, um, and then they don't completely cut off tradition, which mm -hmm. is, <laughs> in other words, they remember mm -hmm. that, you know, they're, these are very old traditions and there's a lot of interesting material, mm -hmm. uh, fascinating, deep material. And so I think uh, I'm, I overall am optimistic. And, and if, <laughs> you know, as a practitioner, if you notice that, that you are feeling happier and that you're being nicer to other people, then it's probably a good thing, a good direction that you're headed in. And if you're noticing that those things are not happening, then something is wrong. <laughs> mm. 